نحفظه ونستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالهدى أرسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساء من يدع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يحسه ما فلا يضر إلا نفسه فقال أز وجل الحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا وقال أز وجل يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون أما بعد رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفتح قولي اللهم أرنا الحق حقا ورثنا الطباء وأرنا الباطل باطلا ورثنا اجتنابا آمين يا رب العالمين Today I'm going to talk about a very interesting topic and I'm going to try to explain it and after I explain it I'm going to give 20 examples which is the topic is on the eloquence of Quran and I want us to understand why Quran when it came to Arabia in fact before I even be begin this conversation it is important for me to mention that whenever prophets were sent to any people it was not the sunnah of Allah that as soon as they go to any anywhere they start throwing out miracles for people to see the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always tried to reason with the people first and when they didn't listen to reason or when it was clear that they're not going to listen to reasoning Rafir, you're not allowed to talk during khutbah so the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they would try to reason with their people and if they did not accept reasoning then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a hujjah, as an excuse over them would give them miracles so it was never like here is a prophet and here is my miracle in that sense the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they always came and they always reasoned with people first then the miracles came later Second, the miracles were given according to the situation of the prophets. So for example, when Musa in his time, the people, they were masters in the art of magic. They were masters in the art of deception and the sly of hand and trickery and illusions. So Musa والسلام, came with something that even the most, even the best magician when he sees what Musa is able to do, he recognizes this is, there, this is, it's like wow, how did he do this? In the time of Isa والسلام, the highest art of mankind was healing people. There were many healers. So Isa والسلام, came and he reasoned with the people first. He showed the miracles later. Even though his, his situation from his birth is miraculous, Isa والسلام, in that sense is an exception. Everything about is miraculous. But he too tried to reason with the people first. And then he showed them the miracles, but he showed them the miracles that were appropriate for that time and that culture. When we talk about Qur'an being the miracle, what miracle did the Arabs understand? Everyone knows and everyone says because we have been taught that the miracle of Muhammad is the Qur'an We all know this. But why? Why was the Qur'an miraculous to the ears of the Arabs? 
why this is this I want to explain this in a new way today that I think you will appreciate. You see, Walid bin Mughira was a chief in Mecca. And Walid bin Mughira was the Arabic language. He was the Arabic language. He was at the top of understanding all aspects of Arabic language. And I will come back about Walid bin Mughira, what happened. But what was significant about Quran, because they were experts at language and poetry and prose and blank verse. And they were experts at spoken word. So what was it so amazing that when even Walid bin Mughira, who is the Arabic language of his time, even he says, wow, wow, I can't believe this. This is what I want to explain today. And then we're out of the many, out of that, we're going to take one subset and dive deeper into it. You see, for any language to be meaningful in the human world, listen to what I'm about to say. For any language to be meaningful in the human world, the cohesiveness will be more and the rhetoric will be less. The cohesiveness will be more, I will explain what I mean by this, but just remember this rule. The cohesiveness will be more, rhetoric will be less. What is rhetoric? For example, let me give you a few examples of rhetoric. So there are two parts of language that I'm talking about. One is rhetoric, one is cohesiveness. Let me give you one example. وَرَبَّكَ فَكَبِّرْ رَبَّكَ فَكَبِّرْ it starts with Ra, ends with Ra. Rabbaka. Okay? Ends with Kaf, and then after Kaf is the Kaf. The two words, in order to show beauty, the two words, they start with, they start the same way, they end the same way. They're like a duplex house, so to say. The same way you find, for example, كُلُّ فِي فَلَكٍ يَسْبَحُونَ Not يَسْبَحُونَ كُلُّ فِي فَلَكٍ كُلُّ فِي كَافْ لَمْ فَا فَا لَمْ كَافْ This is just one example of rhetoric. One example. One type of rhetoric which you can find in the Qur'an. Another example of rhetoric. So, okay. So there are many there is over, even in the English language, even in the English language, there's over 50 different types of rhetorics. Rhetoric devices that use in literature. Even more, like simile is one, metaphor is one, hyperbole is one, so many. There's over 50 different ways of showing rhetoric. But the issue here is when the rhetoric, like the Quran, is more rhetorical, then it is cohesive. I'm going to give you an example of what I mean. So one of the devices of rhetoric speech is simile. We all are aware of similes. Okay. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about a alim in Bani Israel, a scholar in Bani Israel, who, who despite being very at a very high status, but he slowly got away from the deen. So Allah says, وَلَوْ شِعْنَا رَفَعْنَاهُ If we had willed, we would have raised him. وَلَكِنْ but he just went towards the earth. He, he went, went down to the earth. And he followed his desires. His example is like a dog. So the example being given is here is of a dog. This is throughout the Quran you find many similes, many metaphors. Here's just one. In tahmil alayhi yalhaz, aw tatrukhu yalhaz. 
If you give him, he sticks out his tongue, and if you don't give him, he sticks out his tongue. By the way, this is scientifically very interesting because we know that dogs stick out their tongue for why? To keep their temperature low. Okay? You know how when you were sweating, the air hits us and makes us cooler when you're very much sweating? So that's what the tongue of the dog does. Now, the point I'm trying to make is that this is just a simile. Allah is giving a simile. I don't have time to explain because I have a lot to discuss today. But I'm just saying that one type of rhetorical um, device is giving a simile. Another is playing on consonants. Playing on con consonants. For example, in Surah Al-Yusuf, Allah says, Ya asafa ala yusufa. Ya asafa ala yusufa. The, the consonants are the same. Ya asafa ala yusufa. Now, in, when you translate it in English, it means, and the grief over Yusuf. Asafa means ala Yusuf, grief over Yusuf. Now you don't see that the the rhetoric in the Arabic language in the English language when it's translated. But the rhetoric is there in the Arabic language. Ya asafa ala Yusuf. Oh what a grief over Yusuf. So this is another example. Sometimes you're playing with the letters, sometimes you're asking a question. Is the reward of good anything but good? It's not a question, it is to make a point. It is to make emphasis actually. It is to make taqeed. But it's not a question, even though it sounds like it's tifham, but it's actually taqeed. These are all not questions. They're taqeed, they're to emphasis, emphasize the point. Omari So ya asafa ala Yusuf This is another example of a rhetorical point The Quran is exemplary in the idea of brevity For example, again from Yusuf wasalam, We can take the example It says The person when he was out of prison And he was giving the wine to the king and the king had the dream he said I know someone who can tell you about this dream now if a normal human being writes he says I, I can tell you about this dream and then I went there and then this happened and that happened but it doesn't do that it says I can tell you someone who can tell you about this dream yeah Yusuf oh Yusuf tell us about this dream so you always find in Quran it's like a, you know when you take a movie you there's gaps in the movie right they show you one scene then another scene, then another scene. So in order to keep it brief, Quran only focuses on one scene, then the next scene. In the things that are not meaningful to the conversation, they're left out. So brevity is another example of the miracles of Quran. And when I, inshallah, am able to do what I want to do today, we're all going to do this mental exercise together, of 20 mental exercises on uh, similes in Quran. And you'll see how your brain thinks versus how Quran says the, uh, the pros. But my point is, there are over 50 ways of being rhetorical. But here was the situation. Uh, there are other rhetorical examples. For example, when Allah uses the same word twice. For example. There are others too. So there's over 50 rhetorical, and maybe one day we can talk about just examples of rhetoric in speech. But the point I want to make here is that when Mughira, he heard, okay, there's this man reading Quran, what's so special? He was the Arabic of his time. He was the Arabic language. When they told him that Muhammad reads this Quran and it has more rhetoric in it, it has more rhetoric in it than cohesive words in it. It has more co uh, rhetoric is more than cohesiveness, yet it is meaningful because it is impossible. Even a Christian, Lebanese Christian, his name is Loi, Loi Shaku, Christian Lebanese, even he says that it is impossible to combine multiple rhetoric devices and, and, have, and, and, and then some coherence and have a meaningful sentence. It's not possible. I wish I was able to do this on board, but... Um, just, inshallah, you'll see, I'll give one example today that will go in length, in, inshallah. Cohesive features are, 
all, uh, all cohesive features are always more than the rhetorical features. Except in Quran, it turned it around. The masters of the Arabic language, they heard more rhetorical features than cohesive features. And even the cohesive features, they were used in multiple ways. For example, wa and. But wa comes in so many different ways in Quran, like wa for example. I swear by time, or consider time. But there's wa al-tafsiri, wa of explaining something further. There's, uh, there's wa al-hal, wa of the condition of something. There's so many different, just wa ataf. There's wa ataf, the, the wa of combining something, like the way you use it in the English language, like an, to combine something. So, just Allah takes even one letter and uses it in so many different ways, just as an example I'm giving you. So Walid bin Mughira, why, when he heard, when he heard about the Prophet, and he heard, there are more rhetorical aspects of the Qur'an than there are cohesive aspects of the Qur'an, he wanted to listen. So what happened? So he goes and hides in the Prophet's house till at the Hajjud time to hear the Prophet read Qur'an. Here is the Arabic language. He is the man of the Arabic language. He is hiding in the Prophet's house to find some mistake. Maybe something different. It's something that he can catch. He listens to Surah Al-Mu'minun and Surah Al-Fussilat in the three days that he was there. And he, sa- he comes back and he says, yeah, I don't know how Muhammad did this, but Muhammad has more rhetorical features in his Quran than he has cohesive features. Because Allah uses the rhetorical features to make the point. Instead of making the point and then using a simile, Allah uses the cohesive features themselves to make the point. I'll give you an example. فَكَانَ قَابَ قَوْسَيْنِ أَوْ أَدْنَى Just take Surah Al-Najm for example. When, Allah, when the Prophet ﷺ was in Mi'raj and he was with Jibreel, right? So Allah says, فَكَانَ قَابَ قَوْسَيْنِ Now, red, we're looking at rhetoric first and then the meaning. فَكَانَ قَابَ قَوْسَيْنِ قَابَ قَوْسَيْنِ They rhyme. قَابَ قَوْسَيْنِ They rhyme. And فَكَانَ قَابَ قَوْسَيْنِ أَوْ أَدْنَى أَوْ أَدْنَى And كَانَ فَكَانَ أَوْ أَدْنَى They also rhyme. So there is retort. There's retort there. And then it's also a simile. Because the meaning of the sentence is that he was as close as two bows. The distance between Muhammad and Jibreel was so close like two bows or more. أَوْ أَدْنَى Or less than that. So, But in this there is no coherent, there's nothing cohesive, but it has a meaning. It is rhetorical, completely rhetorical. It has rhetor- other rhetorical features which you have to know Arabic to understand. فَكَانَ قَابَ قَوْسَيْنِ أَوْ أَدْنَى Completely rhetorical, but yet meaningful. This was the miracle. This is what Quran, when, he, when the Quran went to the Arabs, it was that there is more rhetoric in Quran than there is cohesiveness. This is what challenged them. That how can we make a speech that is more rhetorical and less cohesive? It is always going to be, even in poetry, you're going to be more cohesive. Describe if and then and how and when and where. And things like similes and playing with words and puns and rhetorical questions, they'll be less, always. But let me just now, just so that you understand, Maybe still it's, you know, it's still abstract what I have said. So now very quickly, I'm going to give you an exercise of your mind. We're only going to take something very simple, simple that's well known in the Arabic language. It's also well known in the English language. And that is the simile. Simile is like this and like that. So we will compare. I will ask you the question. The first question is, exam- get, think of an example in your mind of a person whose heart has become hard. His heart has become harsh. Somebody whose heart is no, no longer humanistic. He doesn't have human elements in his heart. Think of an example in your mind. Think. And now I will tell you what Quran says. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مِن بَعْدِ ذَلِكَ Then after that your hearts became like stones. Okay? It was like stones, but even more than that. 
because in the Malhijarati Lamaya Tafajjaru in Anhar, even water comes out of stones. Allah says their hearts became harder than stones, even water comes out of stones. Even if water doesn't burst out of stones, there's some rocks, there's cracks and water comes out. Even if not that, there are rocks that fall down. They're somewhere high. And you know, have you ever seen those signs, rocks falling? Be careful. When you're, rocks, they fall out of the fear of Allah. Even if water doesn't, at least something happens to a rock. This is, this is, now let's go on to another example. Give an example of a good word. Someone says a good word, a kind word, a good word. Think of an example, a simile. Make a metaphor, a simile, an example in your mind. Think of one. Allah says in the Quran, Allah gives the example of a good word. Of a good word. Think of an example in your mind. It's like a tree. A pure tree. Its roots firmly established in the ground. And its branches reaching the sky. Okay. Third. Think of an example. A simile. Imagine someone is a great singer. Describe to me how great his singing is. Describe for me the great singing of a great singer. How would you like to? You think of your favorite singer. How would you describe him? Give me a simile to describe a great singer. Allah says about Da'ud. Allah says, Ya jibalu awwibi ma'ahu wa tayyib. Oh mountains. The music of Da'ud is so beautiful that even the mountains that are rocks will move. And you know the birds, they're known for their beauty. Right? The beauty of their voice. The birds are known for the beauty of their voices. Allah says, Oh, mountains move and the birds. You, you also sing the praises with Dawud. So the mountains that are stones, this is the example that Allah gives. If you were to give an example of someone who's great at singing, what, what came to your mind as a simile, as an example? Give an example. You know, there are two types of human beings. There are the people that are, they have basira, they have intellect. And then the people, they are good with their hands. There are very few, sometimes but somebody has both qualities. He's good with his hands and he's also good with his mind. How would you describe the person who is good with his mind and good with his intellect? You know, in school, sometimes you have the nerds and then you have the jocks, right? Or, so, so that's, how do, you, what do you, how do you combine? Because the prophets of Allah, they were both. They were extremely smart, but they were very good with their hands. Like Allah mentions about Yus, uh, Daud uh, making things with iron. And uh, in the Bible, at least, it says that Jesus was a carpenter, so on and so forth. So, how do you say somebody is extremely smart? but extremely uh, good with uh, doing things. Think of it in your mind, give a simile. He's like what? Like a lion, he's think. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَذْكُرْ أَبْدَنَا Ibrahim." And remember our servant Ibrahim, and Ya'qub, أُولُوا الْأَيْدِي وَأُولُوا الْأَبْصَارِ They were the people of their hands, and they were people of insight. Can you think of a better simile? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and by the way, and we know this to be true psychologically today too. There, there are, we tend to be either on the left side or the right side. I might go into this later on. Okay, here's another example. Actually, I'm going to skip this example for last. Uh, give an example of someone who is, give a simile in your mind. Again, this is mind exercises that I'm trying to do with you guys. Give an example of a simile in your mind of someone who is free and someone who is chained by his desires. Because in Islam, the one who is chained by his desires is the one who is not free. You know, you want to know the Islamic concept of freedom. The Islamic concept of freedom is, are you 
chained by your desires, your hawa, your nafs, your ego, or are you free from that, then you're really free. So anyway, the point I'm trying to make is give an example in your mind, is simply in your mind of someone who is free and someone who is chained, whose desires are chained. Thought of it? Now I will tell you what Allah says. <laughs> is the one who is crawling on the ground because his, 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 his appetite is on the lower part of his self. Right? The lower part of his self. So Allah says, is the one that's crawling on the ground, is he going to be guided? <laughs> or the one who is standing straight and walking straight. Can you think of an example? Now another one. How would you say in your mind, give an example, give an example, and this by the way, uh, I will explain this I in a little bit, just a few words more. But give an example of your mind, if you were to say, if you were to say, give an example, give a simile, that are you secure from the power of Allah? Do you think, because Allah in this ayah is saying, do you think you're secure from me? That I can't grasp you, that I can't touch you? Do you think you're secure from me? Think of an example in your mind, a simile in your mind, about saying the power of Allah and that you're not free from Him. Think of something in your mind. And then let's see what Quran says. Quran says, Aamintu man fis sama? Do you think you're secure from the one who is on the sky, meaning at the highest level? That, you, that an earthquake would not swallow you up? Do you think you're secure from Allah that He would not send a wind, a, a, tor a, a tornado type wind, a strong wind and destroy you? Then you will know how my warning was. Did you not see how the people before were also destroyed? Didn't they think they were secure? Think, this is a simile. Here's an interesting one. Think if you are going to be brought back from resurrection on the Day of Judgment. Think. How would you describe it in simile in a powerful way to say, yes, you will be definitely brought back to life. One is the one the Arabs can understand it better than the non-Arabs. Like in Surah al uh, uh, When the ayah comes to my mind, I don't remember right now. This moon shadda. And Lam Shadda, Thumma Latub Asunna, and then it continues. It's in Surah al Anyway, over here, think of a simile of how Allah says, You will be definitely raised on the resurrection, on the day of resurrection. Think of a simile, of an idea, of a metaphor. How would you describe this? This is how Allah describes it. وَقَالُوا And they say, those who deny resurrection, أَإِذَا كُنَّ عِظَامًا when we are bones, when we are bones and scattered, do you think we will be made into a new life? This is what they were saying. Now the simile comes. Even if you were stones or iron. And you know what's so interesting? Fossil fuels, or uh, fossils, that we get, you know, when people, when you die and things die. Fossils are stones, and fossils become fossilized by the by the process of iron, iron oxidation, or something like this. If you look up fossils and iron on Google, you'll see it. And not only is this a scientific fact, but in terms of simile, if you were to give an example of, yes, you will be raised on the Day of Judgment, Allah says, they say, oh, are we going to be raised back up to life? After we're all dust? Yes. Even if you were stones, you would be brought back to life. Even if you were iron, you would be brought back to life. Or even something greater than that that is in your heart. The ayahs continue. I just want to continue, inshallah, because time is running out. Here. If you want to explain to somebody, inshallah, I'm going to continue my second khutbah right now. Uh,
please move forward. I have 10 more examples to go through, so let's inshallah. So now think of a way you want to give in simile, just similes. You want to tell somebody, don't be arrogant. Give me an example of don't telling someone, don't be arrogant. Think of a simile. Allah says in Surah uh, Bani Israel or Surah Isra, Allah says, وَلَا تَمْشِي فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَحَا إِنَّكَ لَن تَخْرِقَ الْأَرْضَ وَلَن تَبْلُغَ الْجِبَالَ طُولًا Don't walk arrogantly on the earth. It's not like as if you're going to walk on the earth and cut down into it. Nor is it like as if you're going to walk on the earth, you'll get taller than the mountains. Can you think of a better example? In another place, in Surah Al-Quran, Allah says, uh, 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 Anyway, I'll come to that uh, when I remember. Okay, we all know this one, but again, this is a simile or a metaphor that Allah uses to make a point. You want to say to someone, be kind to the parents. Be kind to the parents. Very common theme in the Quran mentioned three, four places. You all know this one. But another place Allah says, You know how a bird puts its wings over its... Because now, even though they're your parents, but now you're treating them like... Their children, like the way the hen would cover, or a bird covers its wings over its or its young, Allah uses this symbol. Think of an example. You want to talk about suffering in life. You want to talk about suffering in life. Allah gives an example of suffering in life. Think of a simile of about suffering in life. Allah says. وَمَا مِن نِعْمَةٍ فَمِنَ اللَّهِ There's no ni'mah except it is from Allah. ثُمَّ إِذَا مَسَّكُمْ Masa means to touch. ثُمَّ إِذَا مَسَّكُمُ الضُّرُّ Then when something evil touches you or some hardship touches you or something difficult touches you, just touches you. This is the point. This is the, the where the metaphor is. Something difficult just touches you. Then what? Then to him you're crying. Then you cry to him. Allah gives you good, 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 good. And then Allah gives you a little bit of test. And then you start crying. You know, it's just like when people say, oh, why is there so much suffering in the world? But if you looked at a hospital, that's like going to a hospital and saying, why is there so much disease in the hospital? People say, why is there so much suffering in the world? There is a lot less suffering, there's a lot more ni'mah, there's a lot more rahmah, there's a lot more mercy. It's like going to the hospital and saying, why is there so much diseases here? Well, of course, the two have to go always sideways. So the same thing, the same idea is here. Another example of a simile in Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالضُّحَا وَالْلَيْنِ إِذَا سَجَرَ By the night, وَالضُّحَا by the morning light. وَالْلَيْنِ إِذَا سَجَى By the night when it is still. You know, when you're at night, sometimes, and sometimes when you're in the day, <coughs> when it's night, it feels like it's always going to be night. There'll never be a day. And when it's day, you feel like it'll always be day. It'll never be night. Just generally in life, you always think things will always be the way they are. Every day I work, I go to, I go to work, I go to sleep, I go to work, I go to sleep, I go to work. Everything seems the same. Allah says, nothing is ever the same. Nothing. There is the morning light, even though by the night when it is still. It's all metaphors, but it's making a meaningful point. This is the point. There's more rhetoric than cohesiveness in the Quran. There's more rhetoric than cohesiveness. This is the miracle of Qur'an. Generally when poetry is done, even in poetry, there's always, whether, you know, there's two, three types of uh, poetry in the time of the Prophet. 
they had the the shi'ar, which is uh, based upon the 14 abhar. They have the fawasil, the meters. And there were 14 of them. And then there is the sija, which is rhyming words. And then there is, uh, there is mursil, which is a straight talk. Always, whether it is straight talk, whether it is sija, whether it is poetry, there will always be more cohesive words and less rhetoric. And out of a hundred or so rhetoric devices used in the Qur'an, more than that, because they're still being discovered, in fact. Out of all the rhetoric devices being used in Qur'an, we've only discussed one. We're only discussing one. Okay, let me give you another example. How would you say, how would you describe that man is ungrateful in a simile, in an example? Think of an example where you describe man is ungrateful. Very quickly, because we're running out of time. Please, everybody come forward. Please, please, please. Allah gives the example of a horse. Look, this horse is in your control. He does whatever you want. This a horse that you own, he does whatever you want. But look at you. This horse does everything you want, but you don't. Look at the horse and your relationship with the horse, and then look at you and your relationship with me. Indeed, man is great, ingrateful. By this example, Allah gives this parable. Think of a simile. Okay, let's take. Uh, I want. I don't have time to go over all of them. So what I'm going to do is, uh, I'm going to give three more, and then we have to call it a day, and I have to skip some of them. Please come forward, please come forward. If you were to say, think of a simile, and this time think hard. Think of a simile and think hard. Think, if you were to say that this world, this universe, if you were to say, if Allah is saying, what simile would you use in your mind to say that this universe is in your control, meaning in the control of humanity? You want to say this wor world, this earth is in your control. Allah is saying, I gave it in your control. Think of a simile, of an, a parable, a simile, an example, a metaphor, something that describes the idea that this world is in man's control. What would you think of? Can you think of? Allah says, it is Allah who has made the world for you like a tamed animal. So walk upon its shoulders like the shoulder of an animal. It's just as tamed. You can do anything with an animal you want. You can do anything with earth that you want. He's made for you whatever is on the earth for you. Can you think of a better simile, a better example? In another place, now let's think about if you wanted to give a simile about the environment about the environment of the world, about being just to the environment, being just in terms of justice, that you wanted to make the point there's a universal scale of justice. You wanted to give this example, that there is some universal law of justice. How would you describe it in a simile? Allah says, and look at the sun, and look at the moon, and this, the, the stars and the trees bow down to Allah. And the sky, we raised it high and put a balance. The sky, we have raised high and put a balance. Don't disturb this balance. And establish the wasn't the thing, the wasn't the weight in justice. And don't shorten the balance. There's a universal balance. This is the simile. And this is about the environment. The environment, when you don't do things properly, then the balance will become imbalanced. Last one before we finish today. Another, try to give me a simile about a husband and wife relationship. A husband and wife relationship. Think of in your mind, how would you describe the relationship?
between a husband and a wife in assembly. Think. And you know, I haven't even done justice because, you know, the real way, the real way to learn about rhetoric in Quran is you have to have human examples in history. You have to take the poetry of the Arabs and say, oh, this is how they did it. This is how it was used to be famous to say this. This is how, this is the best that the humans had come up with and then compare that with the hadith of the Prophet and then compare the hadith of the Prophet with what the Prophet, because the Prophet said about himself, and al Arab, I'm the best of the Arabic speakers. And even the Quran and the Prophet's language are two different vocabularies, two different styles of talking, meaning the Quran is a totally different style of, style of talking compared to the hadith literature. But then when you compare the hadith of the Prophet with the Quran, you see the difference there also. Anyway, how would you describe the relationship in a simile form, the relationship between a husband and wife? Allah says, Please come forward. Everybody come forward, there's some people in the back. You are a covering for them, they are a covering for you. What does a covering do? A covering protects. You are a protection for her, she's a protection for you. What does clothing do? A uniform do? Identity. She is your identity. You are her identity. Right? What else? What does else clothing do? The clothing hides your faults. Right? Hides your aura. Clothing hides your faults. That same way, the wife is she who covers her husband's faults. The husband is he who covers her wife's faults. Just by this simile, hunna libasun lakum wa antum libasun lahunna. Think of some simile that comes equal to this, because you can give a whole lecture just on this word. Hunna libasun lakum wa antum libasun lahunna. You give a whole lecture on this. Think of a simile where you can describe the relationship between a husband and wife in a simile that's as powerful and dramatic and deep as this, that is just not a simile just for the sake of being a simile, but is also meaningful and coherent. Because when you are do doing eloquence of language, what happens with the poets is sometimes when you're describing things in poetry, you may lose accuracy. Because, well, you know, you have to put some spice into your language to make it rhyme and you have to twist things a little bit so that it, it looks good, so the rhetoric is there. But when you do that, you may lose the accuracy. In the Qur'an, Allah uses many rhetorical devices, but never loses the accuracy of what Allah is trying to, or what He intends to say. So inshallah, uh, summer camp is on. If, and also tomorrow we're going to the zoo. We have about 21 spots, I believe, or less. Uh, if any family wants to go with their children to the zoo tomorrow, it's $20 per head. Uh, you're free to come with us, inshallah. You're welcome to come with us, rather, uh, if you want to come. Um, and also, um, uh, there will be Arabic class today, and summer camp is continuing. Inshallah, jazakumullah khairan. Let's do dua and pray, inshallah. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana, wa fi al-akhirati hasana, wa kin a'adhaab al-naf. Rabbana zalamna anfusana, wa in lam taghfil lana wa tarhamna. لنكوننا من الخاسرين اللهم تجل خلافة المسلمين في هذه الأرض اللهم انصر من نصر دين محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم تجل القرآن ربي قلوبنا ونور صدورنا اللهم اغفر لنا ورحمنا اللهم اغفر لنا ورحمنا اللهم ارزقنا اللهم زدنا علما وعملا صالحا اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد إن الله يعملكم من أذل والإحسان وإتاء ذي القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي عيدكم لعلكم تذكرون اذكروا الله يذكركم فاستجب لكم فأقيموا الصلاة